Welcome everyone to uh, session number three of best practices for this year. Uh, it's great to everyone have everyone back. Um, we're without Jeff Franklin with his weather update this this time, but uh, Francisco will be filling in for him, pulling double duty tonight. So, uh, without any further ado, uh, Francisco, if you'd like to introduce Zoe, and we'll get on with it. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, this evening, and it's Dr. Zoe Milikovsky. Zoe has a big experience working with apples and also with uh, grapevines. She has been working with, uh, in California and doing different kinds of studies with rootstocks and seeing their relationship and their reaction with the different side. So this is a very interesting topic for us as we are starting to, to see the advantage of different rootstocks. So, Zoe, please. Great, thank you so much for having me here today. And yeah, I'm thrilled to share a little bit about our research that's ongoing, looking at root shoot interactions in grapevine. And so I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Faculty of Agriculture at Dalhousie University. And um, you can find me on Twitter at Zoe Midge and the grape root project that I work on is on Twitter at Vitus Roots. So I'm speaking to you from my home in Kempville, Nova Scotia, which sits on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. So I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that. So what is grafting? So as you're probably aware, grafting is when you have the opportunity to surgically join two parts of different plants together. And so you normally take a shoot or scion of one plant and the roots or rootstock of another. And this is an ancient horticultural practice that really enables clonal propagation, but it can also be used for other, other reasons. And so the way that grafting works is if you had the stem of one plant, you could use a tool, for example, this here is an omega tool. This is a great visualization from a recent paper in communication biology. And so that tool is used to basically puncture out um, part of the stem, and then you do the same thing to the root system or rootstock. And so then those two pieces of the plant across two different plants can be joined together and then you seal them up and you let them grow together. And as that heals, you get a graft junction. And then you have two, one plant with two different individuals, one on top and one on the bottom. And so that lets you get benefits from the plant that's on top um, in terms of the fruit that's being produced and then benefits from the plant that's on the bottom for the root system. And of course, we're talking specifically about grapevines today, but there are about 70 woody perennial crop species that are grafted. So um, that includes grapevines, apples, and many other woody perennial um, crops. And so why do we graft? So uh, like I said, it's very beneficial for making uh, new plants through clonal propagation, but in grapevines, grafting actually began in the late 1800s. And this happened because there are wild grapevines that live across North America. And then there was the domesticated European grapevine that is Sinifera found that was growing in Europe. And so in the late 1800s, people took wild North American grapevines and brought them over to Europe. And along with those plants came Phylloxera, a little louse that lived on the roots of the plants. And while the North American plants were able to live in the presence of Phylloxera because they were either resistant or tolerant, because they had grown in that environment for a very long time. In Europe, the plants were susceptible. And so it really decimated the European wine industry. And the only way to rescue the wine industry was through grafting. And so they were able to take roots from plants that were found in North America and graft them onto the shoots or scions of the European grapevine so that the roots were no longer susceptible to phylloxera, but then they still had the grapes of the plants they, um, that they desired. And so disease is one of the main reasons to graft plants. And although it was initially done for phylloxera, there are many other grapevine diseases like um, nematodes and other diseases where rootstocks can also be used to help make the plants able to grow in different environments and soils. But it's not just diseases. So for example, in apples, this is a picture of a scientist at the United States Department of Agriculture 
holding up their arm to indicate how short one tree was. And that's because one of the ways that you can also use grafting is to result in a plant that is uh, that is smaller than other plants. And so um, by using a different root system, you can cause the plant to remain smaller. And that becomes very beneficial. For example, if you have to harvest a lot of fruit off of it, you don't want it to be as big and tall um, and difficult to harvest. So those are just a handful of the reasons that we might use grafting. I work on a project called Adapting Perennial Crops for Climate Change. So this is research funded by the National Science Foundation in the US. And basically, the goal of the project is to ask, what is the role of the rootstock in determining traits expressed in the scion and grape? And so we use grapevines as a model to help understand what the consequences of grafting are and how the root and shoot systems of a plant interact. And so I just want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the other individuals that are working on this project who've been involved in the work that I'm sharing here today. In particular, my advisor, um, Dan Chitwood, who's at Michigan State University, and Allison Miller at St. Louis University, and Dan, Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, who's the lead PI on the project. So to answer this question, my research takes place in two locations. There are other individuals in the project working across different sites in the United States, but my work focuses on Missouri and California. So yeah, okay, so I'm going to start with the part in Missouri. And so in Missouri, uh, we're working with an experimental vineyard here. And so the experimental vineyard is designed like this. So there is a um, one scion, which is Chamberson, which is a hybrid um, grapevine. And then it has three different rootstocks. So there's 1103P, 3309C, and SO4. And then there's chamberson that's growing on its own roots, so it's not grafted, and it's planted in an experimental design. So we have replicates of the different rootstocks, and then also different irrigation treatments that are built into the experiment. So as a part of this project, we've looked at many different traits across this experimental vineyard, which allows us to control for environmental variation across the vineyard to see how different plants respond to um, how different root systems respond to the irrigation treatment and how the scion differs depending on what root system it has. And so just a couple highlights. So this is a paper that we um, published in 2019 in horticulture research. And so more details are available there. But some of the findings that I'm just gonna briefly highlight is one of the things we looked at was mineral composition. And so it makes sense that if you have different roots, in the soil, there might be a difference that is predictable in terms of what minerals those roots are taking up. And that's exactly what we found when it came to nickel composition. And so we took leaves from all the chamberson vines. And so the, the individuals that were being sampled were genetically identical, but they had different root systems. And what we found was that when vines were grafted to SO4, they had significantly higher levels of nickel in their leaves. So uh, nickel's not a macronutrient, obviously, but um, there are places in the world, for example, in the serpentine soils of California in some areas where there is high nickel in the soil and having a root system that is gonna uptake even more nickel might be not considered desirable in those areas. We also looked at how different genes are expressed um, based on what root system you have. And so um, we did this using a technique called RNA-seq, which basically looks across the genome of the plant to see how different genes are turned on or turned off um, depending on the different root systems. And we looked at that across time. And what we saw was in each of these, you have the ungrafted vines and then they're compared to the different root stocks. And so in most cases, a lot of the genes are shared across um, a lot of the genes are shared across the ungrafted vines and the different rootstocks, um, but there are also genes that are uniquely expressed in each of the rootstocks relative to the ungrafted vines. And so, for example, with a 3309C, there's 105 genes that had significantly different, different uh, ex gene expression patterns in Chamberson relative to the ungrafted vines. So it, it becomes clear that 
the rootstock is having a complex effect on the shoot system because these this is gene expression sorry I should have said this is gene expression as well in the leaf tissue and so depending on what root system you have that's going to control or contribute to variation in what minerals you're uptaking and which genes are being expressed. It's also going to have a major impact on vine growth. And so here we see the pruning weight, so the amount of dormant cuttings that were taken from the vine. And if you compare the ungrafted vine to each of the grafted vines, they have significantly higher pruning weights, indicating that they had significantly higher vegetative growth in comparison to ungrafting vine, ungrafted vines. So grafting the vines generally causes them to increase in size or vigor. And so they have a lot more vegetative growth and there's a lot more pruning that has to happen um, and cuttings that are removed. And then we did, um, working together with uh, an enologist, Misha Kwanineski, um, to perform an analysis of the volatiles in the wine and in the berries from these grapes that have been grafted to different rootstocks, we actually saw some significant differences in some of the components in the wine volatiles. And so this indicates that not only is the rootstock impacting the size of the vine, but some of those differences are also being transmitted to the final end product, the wine, um, which is of course really important to the grape growers and winemakers. And so in this example, we see that linalool, which is what contributes to the, uh, the floral aroma of Riesling is significantly higher in the grafted vines in comparison to the ungrafted vines. And in another example, um, TDN, which in high levels can contribute to a kind of kerosene like aroma is significantly lower in 1103P um, vines or vines that are grafted to 1103P than those grafted to the other rootstocks or to ungrafted wines. And so we can see that the rootstock is having an effect not just on the vine as it grows and um, on its, as it's growing, but also on the berries and what the uh, final end product is. So to further explore this, I analyzed data that was collected in California in an experimental vineyard in San Joaquin County. And so in this study, there were two scions that were grafted to 15 different rootstocks and evaluated across five years. And so um, you don't have to look at this too closely, but basically this is the experimental design. So there's Cabernet Sauvignon and there's Chardonnay. And then there's 15 different rootstocks that they're each grafted to, and then they're all replicated many times. And then across that, there were five years of data that were collected. And so the question in the study is, how does rootstock choice influence both vine growth and berry characteristics? And so to do this, there were a number of traits that were evaluated. So within the vine, we looked at pruning weight, yield, Ravaz index, or a measurement of crop load, which is calculated by dividing yield by pruning weight. And in the berry, there was berry weight, cluster number, soluble solids content, pH, and titratable acidity. And so, of course, um, in California, these rootstocks are used to protect against phylloxera and sometimes other diseases as well. But what are they doing to the vine itself? And is there an optimal rootstock choice for a particular environment or scion? And so here I've got each of the eight traits that I just shared, and you can see along the bottom of the plot, there are the different years. So it ranges from 1995 to 1999, because these are historical data that we looked at. And then the values along the y-axis, and at the top there's the Cabernet Sauvignon, and at the bottom there's Chardonnay. And each of these colored lines indicates one of the 15 rootstocks. So just as a overview, what you can see is that there's very little crossing over of the lines. And so when you look at the traits and look across years, you can see that the lines are pretty smooth and they don't tend to cross over a lot. And so what that indicates is that if a rootstock has a particular value in one year relative to other rootstocks, that tends to be consistent across years. So there's not a large interaction between rootstock and year rootstocks that perform at a particular level in one year tend to be consistent in that across years. And so we definitely see differences across years, which is expected. For example, there's um, lower yields in 1996 and 1998. 
Um, and that might be due partly to um, rainfall. So for example, in the dormant season during 1997, there was less rainfall when floral initiation would have occurred. And so that might have led to the lower yields in 1998. But what we see is that even with the fact that sometimes the weather is going to have a negative effect, a rootstock that was good in one year relative to the other rootstocks is still going to be um, good in subsequent years. And so to look at really what a major effect rootstock can have on these traits of interest, I've plotted out each of the eight traits. And then here you have the percent change from the lowest rootstock value for the median value to the highest rootstock. So if you picked the rootstock that would have given you the lowest value, how much could your, um, your trait change if you had the highest one? And so here it's in percentage. So you can see that the difference is over 50% for growth related traits like yield to pruning rate ratio or crop load, yield and pruning weight. And so for yield, if you made the wrong rootstock choice in comparison to a rootstock that would give you the highest values, you could increase your yields by over 75%. So you can have a really significant effect on important traits by selecting the right rootstock. I'm not gonna have time to get into it today, but we're continuing to examine rootstocks effects in California. And so here are some of the students that I've worked with in particular, Joel Swift, who's a PhD student at St. Louis University. And together we sampled two different scions and three rootstocks across a 200 kilometer transect in California throughout the growing season for two years. Um, and we've looked at traits like mineral composition, gene expression, bind physiology, leaf shape, the microbiome, and way more than I could even um, put on this slide. And so the data analysis for this is underway right now, and I um, would be happy to share the findings with you at a future date. And just briefly before I finish, I wanted to share a little bit about a study that I contributed to looking at rootstock effects in Nova Scotian vineyards. So as I shared, I'm funded through a project in the United States and most of my research currently focuses on American vineyards, but I had the opportunity to collaborate with scientists at Agriculture Canada here in Kenfield, um, who we also worked with Acadia University to look at the effect of grafting on the root microbiome. So this is a project led by Shaqat Ali and Harrison Wright. And we looked at the grape microbiome using both bacterial and fungal, uh, both the bacteria and the um, fungus at three different soil depths. So um, zero to 30, 15 centimeters, 15 to 30 centimeters, 30 to 50 centimeters, and then also three different rootstock combinations. So there was New York muscat own rooted, um, grafted to 3309C and grafted to riparia galore. And so we could use microbiome data to look at how the bacterial and fungal composition differs depending on what root system that you have. And what you saw was looking at the different bacteria, there was a much greater overlap across different root systems for bacteria. So about 66% of the genera of bacteria overlapped across all three different combinations in comparison to the fungi where only 28.3% overlapped. And so it looks like there is a more unique effect across different root systems for fungi than there is for bacteria. And when it came to which rootstock led to the most unique bacteria or fungi, for 3309C, it had the highest percentage of unique bacteria. And then for Riparia grillor, it had the highest percentage of unique fungi. So if you're interested in learning more, I'm happy to answer a few questions now. Um, and you can also find the results of the study, study that I just shared um, available online. This is free for download um, at Plant Direct. It's called Grapevine Rootstocks Effect Growth-Related Sign Phenotypes. And so these are my co-authors and collaborators on this work. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm happy to take a few questions now. Thank you, Sorry, for your presentations. Super interesting uh, to see all your research and in different areas and with different science and rootstocks. So to the public, I invite you if you have any questions to go to the future Q&A. You can type your 
your questions there and we can read and, and ask you so. So meanwhile, I, I would like to ask you, meanwhile, we are waiting for, for, for some questions. Um, you were showing the yield between 1997 and 98 in California. So you, you said that diminish a little bit the, the, the production. Could, could you repeat a little bit? What yeah, so I mean, of course, we know that year is going to be the strongest contributor to variation in traits because <laughs> the environment and the weather um, are all playing a major role. And so um, I was able to account for that in my model and see that rootstock still had an effect. But in particular, we saw lower yields in 1998. And when I looked at the historical weather data, I was able to identify that there was less water or precipitation during the dormant season when floral initiation would have occurred um, in 1997. And so floral initiation in grapevines um, occurs the year prior to um, when they're actually growing. And so um, you have to look back to 1997 to see why yield might be low in 1998. And so that's what we found uh, of course, these vines are irrigated during the growing season, but they might not be irrigated during the dormant season because normally in this area of California, at least, you would have enough water during the dormant season. So you would generally only irrigate during the growing season when it was drier. Um, and so having low levels of precipitation then might lead to lower yields, even though there were no fruit on the vine at the time. Thank you, sorry. It's quite interesting to, to see how it can impact that to the physiology yeah. of the plant. Yeah, it's, I mean, grapevines are you know, pretty unique and interesting in that way that you can't just think about what the weather conditions are like now, but they're, as perennials, they're a record of everything they've experienced in the past as well. And so the years of weather in the past, and especially the year prior, but all throughout their growing uh, and their life cycle is going to contribute to the final vine and product that you see at the end, at, in a particular year. Thank you. Thanks. I'm still waiting for more questions, so I will continue, sorry, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, no problem. In, in your first experiment in Missouri, you were working with a Chambersan or Chambersan. Mm -hmm. um, did you measure the uptake of any other nutrients instead of nickel, like nitrogen, potassium? Yeah, so we looked at 17 different ions, and I showed the nickel because that was the strongest rootstock we have effect we saw, but there has been lots of evidence that other um, mineral uptake is impacted by rootstock. Um, and so like molybdenum was another one that we saw a significant effect of rootstock, but nickel was the strong, like the most amount of variation in nickel was, um, was across rootstock. Um, across all the ions or minerals, that was the one we saw the strongest effect for. And so something we're continuing to measure in California with different rootstocks, with different scions to see how those two things interact. Because um, of course, in this case, we're only looking at the effect of mineral composition on Chamberson. And a lot of the work that's been done has been done on vinifera vines as well. So it'll be interesting to see how these things respond. And there's been a couple more years of data collected since I published this work. So um, it'll be interesting to see how those trends hold up across years. But, uh, but yeah, we did see a significant impact on other minerals, but the strongest impact was on uh, nickel. Okay, perfect, thank you. Now I have a question, uh, sorry for you. Thank you very much, interesting presentation, sorry. Will you comment on selection of rootstocks for unique aspects of Nova Scotia situation, such as cold hardiness and clay soil types? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I'm not really sure what the best option is for Nova Scotia in that regard. I think that um, it's a complicated question, partly due to the fact that you're reliant on what's available in terms of the scions that you're interested in and what's like and what's available grafted to particular rootstocks. So even in California, 
a lot of the same, few, even though I'm doing this experimental study looking at 15 different rootstocks, a lot of the same handful of rootstocks are used because that's what's widely available from nurseries. And so um, I don't know what the best option is for Nova Scotia situation. I haven't seen anything on differences in rootstocks for cold hardiness specifically. Um, rootstocks are composed of North American wild grapevines, so they would generally all be pretty cold hardy. Um, and I'm not sure if there's one that would do particularly better, but differences in ability to respond to the amount of water that there is in the soil is something that is definitely important for Nova Scotia. So some of the rootstocks that do well in California because there's very limited water and it's very controlled by irrigation would probably create vines that were too vigorous and large in Nova Scotia. And so you would want one that was not quite as effective as uptaking water as you would in a drier climate. So that would probably be then in addition to looking at disease resistance and pest resistance to the um, to what was present in the area, that would be the probably the biggest consideration is looking for one that's not too vigorous because we have a lot of water here already. Yeah, a higher amount of organic matter as well, so. Yeah. An input. So, well, it's, it's, it's time. We don't have uh, more questions, sorry. So I really like to thank you again. It was an amazing presentation. It's very interesting to know all the research and man, you are here. So we are very thankful to, to have you between us. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining in and listening to me. I appreciate your time and I hope you have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. That was really interesting. Uh, yeah, thanks, Zoe. Um, a lot of interesting work. It would be really interesting to know, uh, you know, in the future, if there could be a study from that same type of science that does delve a little uh, more directly to the to the issues here. Uh, could there be a study that, that does take into account more our shorter seasons and our wetter soils and, and everything? So yeah, a lot of really nice science there. So that was great. Uh, now, uh, Francisco is going to present. And uh, like I said before, he's going to be double presenting today on the, the weather data and then also doing his update on the vineyard tasks. So uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Francisco. And go ahead. I will be sharing my screen. Steve, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the, the introduction, Steve. Today we'll be talking about a little bit of weather update. I will not be as deep as uh, Jeff and talking about canopy activities. So about weather update, I will be talking about the soil temperature, growing degree days and the precipitation and everything will be until June 30. Also, I will be mentioning a little of leaf identification because this is a very often question about phylloxera, damage, and downy mildew, how to distinguish what is happening in each one. And a couple of main kind of the activities which will be continue, continue this discussion in the growers discussion about tacking, leafing, and hedging. The soil temperatures, well, these, all this data is until June 30 from the Campbell Research uh, Station. And it's showing that the soil temperature in the first 35 centimeters, okay? From 2016 until 2021. And it's very interesting to see how the ev evolution of the temperature has been this year. As you remember, we, we had a, a warmer season compared to other years. So the trend was higher and at the end, you can see in, in, in June 30, even that 2020 was higher than this year. So that, that is couple, uh, quite interesting. I'm not very sure uh, the reason, but we have a lot of similarities with uh, 2020 in terms of soil temperature. When we see the growing degree days, um, we can see again until June 30 and from 2016 until 2021, the trend has been 
uh, higher uh, than the average of the last 10 years. The only exception that you can, we can see here is the yellow line, which corresponds to 2018. If you remember, it was a quite cold year where um, the bad doors start even in some varieties at the beginning of June. So you can see uh, this gap and huge difference. And 2021, it's, it's quite high. Also, we have uh, some similarities with 2017 and 2020. So it's a, a good uh, indication of how it's coming the season. There you can see the, how, how close are each one. Even though 2021 is higher, you can see more information about the growing degree days in the great blog where we are updating, thanks to Jeff Franklin, uh, all this information. And in terms of precipitation, yeah, so sorry, in terms of precipitation, um, you can see from 2012 until 2021, and in the black line, you can see the average of the last 10 years. And again, we're slightly uh, below the average, uh, below the average, and we can see again, the biggest difference in, in 2019 was huge amount of precipitation. Anyway, here, if we are comparing with 2020, the values are slightly similar between 2016, 17, and, and 2021. 16, so sorry, 2020, 2021. And now something that I want to take to your attention is this line, which corresponds to 2012. If you had been following the growing degree days in the grape block, you can see that 2012 was one of the warmest year in the last 10 years. And we had as well a, a very low precipitation. So that is something to keep in mind because that will have an impact in the phenology of the plants, such as bloom uh, or operation. Already we have an er earlier variation that previous years um, and bloomed than previous year and the reason it should be seen. Here I wanted to show you a little bit of how has been bloomed and the fruit set in different varieties. And on the left, you can see Oscilla Musca and on the right, Castel. And if you can pay attention to the cluster of Oscilla Musca, it looks uh, a little loose. Meanwhile, Castel looks uh, more complete with more berries. But what it can happen that Castel had a bad burst earlier than Oscilla Musca and the climatic conditions were better. So we had less humidity, uh, which allowed a proper pollination. Meanwhile, Oscilla Musca after bloom had more precipitation and humidity, which can increase the, uh, the abortion of, of potential berries. In these uh, two pictures, you can see a little of the difference of between Lacadie, which uh, had a difference of like a, uh, almost a week with the, the bloom of Frontenac Gris. So Lacadie, it's almost peppercorn size, and Frontenac Gris, it's already in, in pea size. So what, it, what means this? That you can be doing some uh, vineyard management techniques in Frontenac Gris, for example, Lithium. At this stage, you will be able uh, to go pass through and take out uh, some, some leaves from the area. Meanwhile, like a day can wait uh, a little bit more. And this is on the left, Riesling, and on the right, Chardonnay. This photo is only uh, from yesterday. So you can see that bloom in some varieties is still going on. So you, you can have this situation in your vineyard. Uh, and, and it can happen depending on locations. That's why when we are mentioning and giving numbers uh, or statistics here of what is happening with the vines are specifically for some locations and it can be depending if your area is cooler, you have more precipitations, your soils are heavier, the plants can react in, in a different way. And now I want to pass uh, briefly to leaf identification as we have been talking in the previous uh, session, scout the vineyard at least once per week. It's 
it's, it's, it's necessary, but ideally it could be twice. So it's good to be checking both sides of the leaf uh, to see what is happening and to identify what it can be. It can be an, an insect, a fungal disease, a chemical or a mechanical damage. So in these two pictures, that is uh, quite often question is, what is phylloxera and what is uh, uranium mite? On the left, we can see the gulls going uh, in of the leaf, inside of the leaf. And that is the example of a gulls of phylloxera. Meanwhile, on the right, on the gulls or bumps, as some people called, going out from the leaves, it's a uranium mine. Here we can uh, see and identify some mechanical damage. You can see some bruise uh, upside, uh, in this part in the front of the leaf. And also you can see behind continue the bruise, but also a small cut. And this is the case of chemical uh, damage. In this case, it was sulfur. Sometimes when you have too much product in the leaf and this accumulate in these areas, plus the temperature and the high humidity that we have, it can cause some damage. So you can see in the front, like it's burned and behind the continuation of the same. And finally, downy mildew, you can see here, it looks uh, like an oil spot. You can see with the, with the sun, like the, the clear uh, symptom. And against the sun, you will see like the oil spot of, of downy mildew. So I, I, to, to continue with this, the canopy activities. Some of the activities we already uh, discussed, like for example, the saccharin, like the elimination of the suckers of different areas of the grapevines. But now I want to talk about tucking, even though we already discussed that. I want to reinforce because this is a process that will continue in the next couple of weeks. So the variety priority, we'll start with the first early varieties. Uh, to facilitate different activities such as the mechanical damage, improve the spray applications, and expose the fruit zone in a proper way. So all that will be uh, helpful to, to improve the ripeness of the fruit through the season. It's important to have the, the shoot well tucked between the wires. Okay, so again, as I mentioned the previous time, Trying to keep clean the trunk will be ideal. And also to keep your VSP in a proper way, so uh, well oriented, that will be very helpful to the spray application. So everything after we have tuck our vines in a proper way will it be easier to be delifting and hedging the vines. Uh, new vineyards, they will need similar labors. They will have to be tacked to diminish mechanical damage and for the spray applications. Here we can see the vines, they are properly tacked. So instead of laying down once we want to mow the grass or clean uh, the, the, the rows, uh, we are not producing damage or diminish the damage to the vines. The other activity that it can happen, in, for example, in Frontenac, which has already pea size. It's focused on the fruit zone, and this can be mechanical, manual, or a combination of both. Okay, so it can be in one side or both sides at the same time, and the exposure can be it's usually from fifty to hundred percent. So, which are the advantage of doing this? Will reduce humidity will increase temperature and the sunlight exposure and will improve the fungicide penetration. And the goal is decrease, uh, to have less disease and enhance uh, the quality. Some consideration if you're doing like a manual leaf removal, it requires more time and you will have to define priorities. You want the morning or the afternoon side or you can use both. In, by my experience, if you have to take a, a decision and give a priority at the beginning, I will tell you the morning side. Why the morning side? Because this will be the side that will ex be exposed to 
to the sunlight uh, early. So you will increase the, the dry, dryness of this area thanks to the sun. So you will have less dew and you will have a potentially less a fungal disease, okay? And after you can proceed with the after uh, side. And the manual leaf removal, we have to uh, tell that it's more gentle than, than the machine. So that's something to, to consider as well. And the fruit zone, again, between 50 to 75% or even 100%. And here too, depending on the vineyard, it can happen sooner or later through the season. I can see some vineyards already that they are almost there to, to be hedged. And the goal is to stop the overgrowth of the vines, okay? So attention, don't wait until the shoots are laying down through the wires, otherwise it will be more difficult to be hedging and keeping the, the shape of, of the vineyard. The, the other of the effects of this is the laterals will grow, filling the trellis, and the new canopy will be active at ripening period. So you will have a very good canopy, which will allow you to to gain more sugar. And the main goal is to be searching the balance of the vine. So parts of the vine decided to be hedged. Well, the first uh, uh, photo and what I like to highlight is, okay, we want to stop the growth and we don't want to have everything laying down and having a, a nice uh, canopy and uh, enhancing the, the laterals to grow to, to cover all the area, the VSP the trellis system and in, increase the, the sugar production. And on the right, we can see, well, the hedger, the machine that will be hedging the top of the, uh, the, the vines and also the sides. So in that way, we'll have a, a very compact and nice area. And once uh, we want to leave or we want to pass to the sprayer, we'll be with the, the plant in good conditions and we are not taking out or eliminating shoots. So now I would like to invite to our discussion a part with Marcel Colt, the vineyard manager of Lagged Vineyards, and Steve Els, a owner of Elsa Farm. So, um, Steve, I saw you first. Uh, how's it uh, have you done or which uh, kind of management practices are you doing in, in your vineyard right now? Uh, so yeah, we're very busy tucking. Um, we've first and second wires are in position. Uh, some of the top wire or third wire is in position. We're just kind of at that stage right now. The canopy is just reaching the top of the trellis. Uh, so we like to get it a little bit above there. Um, we try to focus more on just wire moving instead of the manual tucking up through the wires. It's just a lot more efficient. So, um, so we're at that stage right now with, uh, with the tucking. Uh, we've done two rounds of suckering um, to keep the, as you mentioned, the, the trunks clean. Um, just finishing up on that right now. So uh, yeah, with tucking and suckering, that's kind of where we are. Um, we started deleafing on Monday in the front neck block. Uh, it was pea size already and hanging down nicely. So we took the opportunity to run through it with the machine. We like to get about 75% off of both sides as early as we can. So uh, we're targeting probably Lackady middle of next week should be hanging down. It's just kind of out straight now, starting to hang down. It's almost peppercorn size. So um, that's where with that. Uh, we'll probably not start actual hedging the tops off or probably about two weeks. We want to get them tucked. Uh, we tend to wait a little bit longer on that. We really only want to hedge once or twice. So we would tend to let them get up a little bit higher, uh, not let them fold over and get in the way or anything, but kind of leaves them. We really don't want to hedge any more than we need to. So that's kind of, kind of where we are in the canopy management. Okay. Marcel, how is your side? Uh, it's about uh, it's about the same. Um, <clears throat> we are still moving wires. Uh, we're getting close to be done with with tucking. Um, suckering has been completed. Uh, we have not started yet with uh, any uh, leaf thinning yet. Uh, we just want to make sure that all the tucking is done first. 
Uh, we did start uh, in some of the very vigorous hybrids with uh, some tip pruning today, um, just to stay ahead of the game to make sure that they're not falling over or starting to lay down on the wire. Um, so we tend to go in early and actually just cutting off like top six inches. Um, so we leave them go about a foot above the top wires and then cut about six inches off um, just to make sure that we have that, uh, that tip gone and uh, start get some lateral movement uh, on the vines. And mostly after that, the, the clusters will start to droop and then we can start with the deleafing of the fruit zone which we're doing about the same. We're, we're trying to get in as soon as possible, as soon as those clusters are starting to, to drop uh, and get about, yeah, about 75% of the leaves off with mechanically. And then we'll go in by hand in areas that are, you know, designated for anything special in the winemaking side. Marcel, and usually in which varieties are you starting uh, to believe? And which varieties you give the priority by hand? Uh, so usually we're, we're doing at least one round of deleafing in all the varieties. It's just opening up that fruit zone, making sure you have enough airflow that goes through it and then um, and also have a good penetration of your, of your chemicals. Um, so uh, it's very important you're opening up your fruit zone. And uh, hand thinning we're doing in, in mostly in the reds. Um, just to make sure that we're getting as much sunlight on that fruit as possible. Okay. Uh, Steve, are you doing this, uh, this management as well, no? In some varieties you give more priority by hand than others. Yeah, so the, the hybrids, uh, we do the same thing. We, we delete everything that's on VSP. So uh, the hybrids generally just get the machine uh, and uh, most of the vinifers would get the machine and then a little later on a hand pass. So we would kind of do with the machine really early. Uh, then we let that lateral growth kind of take place and everything kind of sometime in August, come back in there and uh, do a full hand deleafing on them, uh, especially with the Pinot, uh, Pinot and Meunier. We would go 100% on both sides. Uh, Chardonnay, that's for sparkling, we'd go about 75% and Chardonnay for still, we go 100%. Okay, perfect. So 100% and do, do you have any kind of damage by sunburn, something like that at, at the end of the season? Or? I've never seen sun <clears throat> sunburn here. No, I, uh, I don't think our temperatures really get hot enough. It would have to be an exceptional year for that. So that's, <clears throat> excuse me. So we, we did see some sunburn in years where we uh, were pretty late in doing it. Mm. So once, once you're, once you're uh, past uh, uh, pea size uh, and, and bigger and you start believing in, in the middle of the summer heat, then we did see some sunburn before. Um, not as drastic. Um, the clusters, they usually tend to get out of it. Uh, later, um, but it's definitely not recommended. So the, the sooner you can get it done, the better. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me for my throat coughing up there, but um, so that's why we do uh, very early machine deleafing. Uh, then we let the berries get acclimatized a bit, and then we go in with the full deleafing a little bit later. So that's kind of uh, that's the strategy to avoid sunburn. Yeah, it's a, it's a good way to get used to it, to the, to, to the berries, to, to the sun. And so you don't have that shock, thermic shock. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. And one thing we didn't, we didn't mention there is uh, with the hybrids, <clears throat> I mean, it has a big uh, thing on quality and everything, but uh, hand picking uh, something that's being deleafed is much more enjoyable than searching through the canopy for the leaves, especially with something like uh, Lackadee, if those little kind of, pinkish green clusters in there everywhere and boy they're hard to find on those big dark green leaves right so um you can you can any of the time that you spend in there deleafing even if you don't have a machine uh you're probably going to save that time in harvest time uh if you're thinking of uh labor hours um and then you also get the benefit 
of healthier fruit, better flavors, less disease, uh, better ripeness. So uh, I know, I know I've heard people say that, you know, I just can't afford to go in there and deleaf. I can't, I don't want to spend those man hours, those person hours deleafing, you know, I can't afford the labor, but uh, I would uh, encourage people to deleaf because I think you're going to save your money in the end. Absolutely. I totally agree with you there, Steve. Uh, there's nothing worse than, worse than trying to uh, grab your, your fruit off the wine and half of it you lose because they're full of leaves and you're trying to pull them out of wines. And it's just, yeah, no, it's just do the deleaving and you'll get your full crop at the end. Before I finish the, 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 this part of the canopy management, how is the tacking going to uh, with you? Tucking is, uh, it seems to be a little bit uh, weird this year. Like it seems uh, it was a slow going and then all of a sudden things started <laughs> to move. Um, uh, and uh, it moved really fast uh, this year. Um, so tucking has been a little bit of a challenge. Um, uh, we've seen years where the only thing we do is we're, we're moving wires as much as we can and then, and then weave in uh, whatever the wires haven't kept, caught. Um, but it's, it's going, it's going slower as usual, but, uh, uh, that's just because the vines have pretty much, uh, surpassed, uh, what we were able to do. Um, but once, once they're in, uh, then, then we can start concentrate on, on deleaving and making sure that we're not overcropping anything for this year. And with you, Steve? Uh, yeah, the leafing or um, tucking seemed to take off just like a, just like a race. Um, <laughs> it, it's been crazy. And, and I mean, with us, we find it's a big difference between varieties. Uh, front neck blonde needs a lot of hand manipulation. It, it tends to not want to grow up right. Uh, it's always an extra pass and a slower pass. Um, guys in Heim, you can just kind of walk by it and tell it to keep on growing straight and not worry about it too much. Uh, Lackadie somewhere in the middle. So, and uh, the vinifera, you know, is, is most of them are pretty good. The pinots tend to lay down a little bit. So, um, this year it's been good. It, we've really had to pay attention to it and not give up on it. Um, it's basically finish one pass and we're right back to the start and and do the second pass and then we're right back and in, in there for the third round through. And uh, it's basically been a little bit of suckering in between. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's growing extremely fast this year. I find, I find the, the shoots have elongated really, really fast. The leaves are big, um, really good growth overall. Yeah. Seems to be a lot of prioritizing your blocks this year. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. 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 And I mean, we're a little lucky. We have a pretty good variety and, and we can pick and choose which ones we put the time into a little bit and, and you get to know your blocks and know which ones are, going to be a quick trip through and the ones that are going to take you know another day longer right so you uh, get those on the schedule and don't give up on them keep on tucking <laughs> well, yes, the, yeah. the hatcher is not the solution <laughs> no. 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 tucking is part of the process to be able yes. to hatch no yes well I, I will move you a little bit of out from the canopy management, but it's related because the vines have been growing very fast. So the uptake of nutrients as well. Uh, have you taken any tissue analysis? Uh, have you seen the results? How are you moving in the nutrient management process? Marcel. Uh, we've been uh, pretty good the last couple of years. We've been trying to stay on top of, uh, of our uh, uh, nutrients in the in the soil uh, so we've done uh, a lot of adjustments over the last couple of years so we're we're pretty solid with the nutrients in the soil um, the only thing we're doing is uh, our uh, uh, bloom a little bit just to help out uh, not to stress the vines too much um, we're thinking of in some parts to do uh, another uh, leaf sample this year, um, but we might skip that one depending on what the weather is going to throw at us in the next couple of weeks. 
Um, so we might just do one at Verizon and and probably call it after that. And Steve, how is it on your side? Yeah, so we um, we keep trying to keep a pretty close eye on it. We did uh, a pre-bloom sap sample. Uh, we got those back and um, everything was pretty good. We saw a couple little deficiencies. Uh, we saw a little bit of deficiency in magnesium and zinc. So uh, we kind of put a plan together to address that. Um, and then we did our, uh, we were kind of late bloom last week. Uh, we did tissue samples. We actually got those back yesterday. Um, and it's really showing the exact same thing. So uh, the thing with the sap sample is it's a much quicker look at what's going on in the plant and the, the tissue sample is a little bit of history what's in the plant so uh, but they agree with each other which is good and um, so we've kind of part way through already addressing those deficiencies uh, we'll do another sap sample kind of um, close to veraison and probably do a tissue one at that time too just to make sure everything's on the right track but um, everything's kind of agreeing with with our soil samples as well. So we, we do do quite a bit of sampling here just so we can react to what's happening. Um, we really learned some lessons from 19 and that cold wet year about what wasn't being converted from the soil through the roots because of the roots being cold and wet. So uh, we learned a lesson on that and, and we do focus a little more on uh, sap and tissue samplings just so we can respond very quickly with uh, foliar sprays. Okay. I have a question for you coming from the public is, did you notice too that the shoots grow more evenly this year? Evenly? Um, so I, I guess thinking back, I mean, we've had some pretty challenging years. They certainly didn't grow evenly in 18 and they didn't grow very evenly in 19. Mm -hmm. um, they started to grow a little more evenly last year. Uh, and, and this year, sure, yeah, I, I think our vineyard looks pretty consistent. Uh, I'm going to chalk that up to uh, a good recovery year from last year, from two very stressful years, and then also uh, a really favorable winter. Um, we had really good uh, um, uh, bud rate, like we lost very few buds, um, the shoots all came out, uh, there wasn't very much damage like to the end of a cane as opposed to you know the basil and the distals were very very even this year so yeah I, I would tend to agree with that we're probably seeing more even growth um, I think it's pretty trackable though I think we're finally coming out of two disastrous years after last year and, and uh, I would expect I mean I was certainly hoping that we were going to see more consistent growth this year and, and in our vineyard we are seeing very consistent growth this year. And I said, how, how can you see? Uh, same, same here. Yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing uh, uh, last year was the first year again that was pretty even for us um, and continues into, into this year. But, but yeah, we had two rough years going and, uh, and it looks like now we're back, back into the normal swing of things. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, and especially if we compare with the previous seasons, it looks quite even and complete everything, which is excellent for us. It was uh, interesting, Francisco, uh, the comment that Zoe made in her presentation about uh, these woody perennials, how they have the history of their life in that plant. And I thought that was a really interesting comment because sometimes we don't think of that. We tend to think uh, what's going on in this growing season. We get so wrapped up in it, but really you know to to respond to the what's happening to the plant you, you probably should be thinking about what's happened in the last three to five years um that's always something to keep in the back of your mind yeah absolutely and, and completely agree and it was nice when she showed all the data coming from california for so many years how it was impacting and making the correlation of the climatic conditions from the previous season yeah i agree Well, we don't have more questions. I think we have covered the main point. Oh, one more question. Hello, I have a question on training new trunks. If the new trunk is very strong, like a bull cane, should I tie it down to the wire as it grows or leave it to tie down next year? 
My worry is that it will break it if I wait. Are we talking here like a new growth shoot? Yes, I think I, I think it's trying well, I think it's a new plant and they are training a new trunk. Yeah, well let it uh, let it go straight up. Through the wires, up through the wires and cut it off at whatever height you want to cut it, six, seven feet. And then next year train it as your uh, as your fruiting cane. Okay. Yeah, Thank I'd agree with that. Train, train it up through the trellis. Keep, yeah. keep it going straight for this yeah, year. Especially keep it going straight. You can always bend it in uh, once you're done with pruning. Yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming that's second leaf, what they're talking about. So mm -hmm. yeah, you'd want it to go straight for sure. Well, we don't have now, we don't have any more questions and we have covered a couple of activities that are happening right now and they will happen in the next couple of weeks. On the top is tucking. I know everybody is tucking and as fast as they can because the growth has been quite fast due the good humidity that we have and moist in the soil plus the heat units that they are quite high. So Steve, would you like to, to give a last words before closing this session? Wow, no more questions? We're getting off easy today. There's got to be some controversy here somewhere, doesn't there? This is, uh, anyway, oh, come on. There's got to be another good question, Francisco. Don't you have one? Aren't you going to try to stump us? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. We don't have any more questions. Well, I can make you another question I have, which is the on the top of your list now, what to be doing? Because, well, we'll be having a lot of precipitation the next couple of days. So how are you looking after, which is your reaction after all this, this water? Because it will be a lot of precipitation and a lot of uh, warm temperatures. So which is your approach to this situation? Well, personally, I'm going to celebrate tonight and go to bed early because I've stayed up the last two nights spraying all night trying to get the whole vineyard covered before all this rain. So. Um, we do a we do a pre bloom spray and and then we get in there one or two pre blooms kind of depends hybrid or vinifera um, right now we're pretty much completely through through bloom here so um, everything is pretty much set some of the late high, uh, vinifera are just finishing um, so it's been a while since that last spray got on so the last two days we covered pretty much the whole vineyard. Uh, trying to get ready for this rain event tomorrow. Uh, and it had been the right amount of time. Like it, we, we were out of protection. Uh, we needed the protection. And uh, I know talking to some people and uh, our vineyard supervisor here, we often talk, uh, if, you're gonna, if you're going to only spray at one point through the season, do it at bloom because the whole crop is kind of dependent on that bloom. So uh, we really do put a lot of focus on bloom and set. Uh, we want to protect those berries right now. It, it has been hot and humid, uh, which can be a challenge for set. So, and it can also, I mean, the, the downy pressure has been crazy lately. Um, we've seen a few oil spots, but we haven't got any true infection. So we're really trying to stay on top of it. But uh, that's that would be my preparation for right now, you know, and already getting in there with that starting of the deleafing as soon as we can to protect that fruit or what, from downy and, and everything else and getting the air on that, but uh, really make sure you have your protection on. Marcel, and, and which is your strategy? Yeah, so we had our, uh, we had two pre broom sprays throughout uh, that's in hybrids and vinifras. Um, so we, uh, we're still have some coverage on there, uh, for the, for the rain that's coming now. Um, but then we're scheduled to, uh, put another cover on right after the rain. Um, we did like a yesterday, I did see one, uh, I did find one oily spot on, on one leaf. Uh, so I know something is happening out there. Uh, definitely uh, to keep an eye on uh, 
and uh, kind of cross my fingers it's only going to rain for three days and not for seven days <laughs> so, uh, otherwise uh, otherwise we'll have to go in in between in between rains in certain blocks but uh, but the coverage that we put on pre-bloom is usually lasting long enough uh, that we that we can stretch throughout all varieties and then just do a post-bloom application Perfect. Yeah, it's very good to keep in mind that what is happening out, I think, yeah. keeping a good protection of bloom and before bloom, because plant is our crop, it's a very good strategy. And let's hope it's not as much as rain as they were saying, and not for so many days. So it can be the protection again uh, through the next week. Would you say you're about 50% through bloom, Marcel? 50, 60? Uh, throughout? Uh, no, no, I'm, we're, we're further ahead than that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say uh, the only thing that we have left right now is some shard and some Riesling, and the rest is all through. Yeah. How is it in your case, Steve? Uh, just a little bit of Riesling. The shard's all through, Pinot's all through, everything's pretty much through, but just the, the Riesling is just finishing up. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There is some. Uh, we still have some Seval that's in bloom. Oh, is that right? Seval's still oh, in bloom. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's still that one is still in bloom. Yeah. Yeah. Which is for some reason this year it's really really late. It had a very late pop break this year, and uh, so I'm not sure. I haven't seen anybody else yet that uh, uh, so seen any other Seval yet. Uh, so. Hopefully, hopefully it's not across the board, and we're just the only ones lagging a little behind on that one. Ours, ours is through. It, I would agree it was a little late than some of the other varieties, a little later than I would have expected it to be. But uh, it's through now. It's a it's peppercorn size now, but oh, uh, but it's it was later than I would have expected it. Yeah. yeah this one, uh, this block is uh, a little bit late in general. Um, uh, because it's also on uh, 10114 grafted. Um, so it, it has the tendency on being a little bit later uh, from, from the graft uh, or from the rootstock. Um, so, but this year is a little bit extreme. Yeah, yeah, ours is own root. And then we actually, we've already gone through and cut one of the clusters per shoot off. Just because we find those clusters are so big that it just, it just wants to kill the plant. So... We thin it right from the get-go. They are very big this year. The yeah, they're class. huge. They're just crazy huge. They're going to be football size. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. part of the public also can see the save valve is low as well. Yeah. 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 Something all over. So this will be interesting to uh, to figure out there, Francisco, if see you <laughs> see what, what the save valve is actually doing this year. Um, so even even like it, it seems somehow not quite right to have such a late uh, butt break in a Seval and then on top of it have a, a, a bigger as normal cluster it seems this year. Uh, so those are usually not two things you see going together. So I'm, I wonder if there is anything going on or if there was anything going on over the winter that would, would give us this kind of a result in the same out. Well, and somebody's saying that as well, market it's on fast forward, hmm. <laughs> even bigger than P size. So yes, I, I, I saw as well in, in a couple of Frontenac and Lucy Gullman, a, a similar situation. It, it could date back to last summer, Marcel, you know, when, yeah. when the crop was being set for this year, last summer, when those buds were being developed, uh, with that heat, it was probably developing a, a larger potential inflorescent than normal. Um, and I mean, that could basically set it back a little bit uh, where the shoots might elongate and get nice big green leaves. But because of the, uh, that larger than normal inflorescent inside that bud, it could delay it a little bit. I seem to recall we did uh, a very early uh, leaf thinning and cluster thinning uh, in the Seval last year. So this could have uh, an effect this year. Yeah. 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 Could be. 
Yeah. Oh, interesting. See, Francisco, I knew if you asked a question, we'd get a good discussion out of it. Just to finish, and the Seibala market are next to each other. So it's definitely Baraton. Yeah. It, it can be some oh. early ones. You can show that definitely. And market with Frontenac, also they have some kind of parentage. So it makes sense, this kind of fast uh, phenology. Oh, for sure. They're all grapes, but they're all so different. It's, it's shocking sometimes. Sometimes I go on when I can go up to the higher part of the vineyard and look down over some of it. You, you see they're all, they're all grapes and they're all green, but there's five different colors staring back at me there. You know, it's, it's, it's really shocking the differences. Anyway, anyway, thank you for, uh, asking a question and getting us going, Francisco. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And uh, thanks to Zoe for a great presentation. Thanks everyone. And uh, we're hoping to be back in early August. Uh, keep you updated on everything that's going on in our vineyards and uh, hopefully what's going on in your vineyards. So thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks very much for Perennia for uh, doing this in collaboration with Great Growers Association. And we look forward to talking to you all again. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Good night.